Hello and welcome back. We've got that lovely uh, double-ended electric locomotive sitting in the background there. And these terrific uh, two-tone green coaches being moved onto the inside line there by the yard switcher with snow plough. Smoothly through that double crossover. Nice gentle stop and we'll switch the points. There we go. And we'll roll the coaches forward so we can just take advantage of the uncoupling ramp there. Gentle move back. I think we've uh, done that nicely forward and we'll stop just in front of the electric locomotive there switch points number 11 and we'll put the uh, yard switcher there with snow plow into the uh, station for a moment we'll switch the points and then we'll move this electric locomotive forward there slightly hesitant to start and we'll collect the coaches now the double ended electric i think was available in one form or another between 1959 and 64 and the, the coaches for a very short period as well. I think they were just to, in the very early 60s there, 61, maybe through to 63, but uh, they really are a great set of models together. So we've got the cover of the 1959 catalogue here with the terrific double-ended diesel R159. Now the model we're looking at on the layout today shares the same bodywork as this model. Um, just with the addition of some pantographs and some different colouring. So trying again, getting the very best mileage uh, out of a model just by making the subtle variations to it. So we'll just uh, get the right page, wherever it is. There we go, R257. Very striking, isn't it, in that uh, green and orange livery. Now she stayed that way till the 1960, I think. So 5960 in the green and orange. And then... 61 through to 64 as we see on the layout today in uh, two-tone green but with some slight variations that we'll we'll have a look at in a moment so we'll just pop that down to one side and then we'll have a look at the uh, the 61 catalog here and we see we've got the uh, the coaches that i've got on the layout today but there's a slight difference these have um trying railways on the side i believe there was a batch made early on with trying railways and then they they transferred over to the the transcontinental name as we, as we see we've got on the on the layout today and interestingly here it says uh, sleek passenger cars to add further variety and color to the transcontinental scene beautifully finished in duotone green livery these models are based upon designs used on many railroads so that's, that's quite a claim as well and there We've got some advice as well. Hitch them up behind the new look R257 electric locomotive illustrated on page 17. And thrill to the spectacle of your latest Crack Express action, in action, sorry. So we'll just uh, flip over to page 17. So, uh, just missed it there. Now, interestingly, even though they've, they've changed the delivery of the model, they've got a rather small on the corner of the page, which I think is a, a little sad. And there we see those two tones of green or duotone green, they're, they're calling it there. Very, very subtle compared to the bright orange, I think. Still with uh, trying railways on the side, like the original green and uh, orange model. So we'll just pop this down to one side. But uh, in 1962, she uh, changed the transcontinental livery and I believe from what I've read that the how she appears here it was never produced with transcontinental on the side it was more like we see on the on the layout today with the the T the TC or so the TR uh, shields I'll get the words out in the moment like, like we see on the side of the um, uh, steeple cab here but a uh, very striking image isn't it we've got those coaches there and we've got the full range of second series transcontinental coaches by this time. So if we just close that up, and then if we have a look at um, the 63 catalog here, and uh, we see the, the model there, and that's how we've got to run the layout today with the, uh, the TR shield on the side. So uh, I think that's a, a more accurate illustration by that time. Still, it's a, a great, uh, Proof of models on that page, isn't it? Really terrific. Interestingly, though, that this mailman set here, or the mailman, 
um, what, what model, what set number is it? RS45. It's a very strange group of models, isn't it? You would have thought they would have made a setup featuring the, the lovely green coaches, but still, they must have had reasonings behind it. So we'll pop that to one side. And here we've got the, the old model in the box, Trying Railways lift off lid box. We've got R257, double ended electric loco twin operating pantographs. So we'll just have a swift look around the box. Same information on the other end, it's a, a sticky paper label on both ends. Excuse me. And we'll just have a, a swift look at the underside. So, what's a sort of cellar tape sitting there? I'm not entirely sure whether the base of this box belongs to the lid, as you'll see when we when we look inside. Um, it's missing this card insert, sadly. There's a little bit of paperwork with it, but it's not complete. So we'll see if we lift off the lid there. Oh, we've got the, the label here. Words of wisdom. It is essential that this locomotive be lubricated before running. Read the instructions carefully. More information there. Suppressor fitted to minimize television interference. I'll just pop that down. So we've got a service scheme book here. We've seen these before, they're fairly extensive. The paper's very, very fragile, and as you can see, it's yellowed enormously. So we'll just have a swift look at the cover of that. We'll pop that to one side. And this should have a sort of a corrugated card in it, really, but we've just got this little bit of foam which wraps around underneath the model. And we've just got some tissue paper keeping in keeping it in keeping it in place. So I'm losing the power of speech here. So we'll just open that out and have a look. So there she sits. So she's done a fair bit of work. There's a little bit of wear and, and so on to the lining on the model. And uh, we'll, we'll see that in a little bit more detail um, a bit later on in the video. I'm not going to dismantle the model today because due to the, the fragile nature of this and the, the wiring is fairly good, but it's always um, quite frustrating putting this, this model back together and trying to get the pins to stay in. So whilst it's in fully running order, I'm, I'm not going to dismantle it today and look inside, but we'll have a look at a, a, um, a service sheet to look at some of the wiring. So they've got these great uh, eyelets in here to represent windows. And there's that, that TR shield. Storming around that first radius curve and into points number seven. And they look great as they work their way through there and we'll snap the point shut. And we're gonna pile on a bit of power now to make preparations for going up the incline. You hear those lovely knurled wheels biting at the track, making a tremendous noise. And the way around the curve there towards the suspension bridge. Just look at this shot here coming across the bridge. Pantographs going up and down. And we're going to back off the power quite significantly now as we come down the other side of the uh, elevated section. So there we have a out of the box. Some uh, lovely detail going down the side of this model. And from what I read, nobody's really sure which particular uh, railway or locomotive this was based on. I, th I think it covers or is similar to quite quite a number of locomotives or well, similarities, shall we say. We can see some wear there on the uh, speed stripes on the front there. And these uh, these illuminate as well. And you uh, drive it quick enough, that lamp that lights up the, the front headlamp makes these glow as well, which is quite a nice touch. And we've got the, the metal horns and this grey roof. I always thought it was odd that the roof was grey on this. I thought it would have been nice to have a colour match. And strangely, we have um, four screws holding holding the roof on, which I think is an odd touch. I think two would have been perhaps sufficient. So we've got the uh, the selector there. So we can, we're on overhead collection at the moment and neutral, so you could have it parked on any part of the layout not collecting current from the wheels or the uh, the overhead or just from the track. So you could run it from the track without without the overhead. So if we're looking at the um, the pantographs, both of them have um, 
a slightly different appearance, don't they? They're both the same type, but one, one tends to stand a, li a little taller than the other. So they develop bad habits over the years. And they tend to gather a bit of a lean on them. You can see a little bit of a bend through them there, but they're a uh, fairly nice condition. And they do do the job quite nicely, but as I say, it is quite a fragile model. And you've got to be careful with these things. So we'll just have a, a swift look underneath. So we've got the, the dummy bogey here and that, that clips in on that plate there. You could clip that out. Quite crude arrangement there. So you, you could replace that or put another another motor in perhaps, couldn't you? Oh, we've got the, uh, the box at the bottom, battery box perhaps. Or a fuel tank on the double-ended diesel. So there's the motor bogey. So same basis of the, uh, the dock shunter and the yard switcher that we've seen quite recently. So nice metal gears, knurled wheels, giving us that uh, really distinctive sound. And we've got this uh, pilot or skirt along the front here. A little bit of rust going on there on the coupling. Should probably attend to that before too long. So it is a fairly tidy condition. Definitely done some running. There's a little bit of wear on those speed stripes and wear to the yellow lining to, down the sides. If I just uh, hold that with that hand, again, the horns are metal. That one's a little bit wobbly. But uh, if we have a look at, uh, I've got a rather beaten up R159 double-ended uh, diesel there. We'll just have a look at that, the similarities. It's, uh, it is the same thing, isn't it? Very clever, getting another model out of, out of the, the basic mould, I think. Although I don't think the, uh, the, the old electrics ever sold that well altogether. So we'll just pop that down and we'll have a, have a swift look at the uh, inside, or the inside of this one, which is almost identical to that one. So we'll have a look at the... Um, service sheet here. So we've got the, the same motor as used in a dock shunter or yard switcher or um, a number of other models. The, um, what's the one on the, on the tip of my tongue? The switcher, the Bobo switcher. So we've got that, that basic motor bogey used there. And we've got to, this cabling here, which supplies the the, uh, the power for the lighting. So these are the pins I was talking about. It's very frustrating trying to fit those and the cables are very short. There's not much leeway. And then the cable running from the collection plate here to the, the selector switch um, just pushes into this, uh, this uh, brass metal plate there and it, it tends to wobble out and getting the whole thing together and assembled. Um, I always tend to find you get it back together and one of them's dropped out. They do tend to drop occasionally whilst in use. So that's my reluctance at dismantling this model today. And the pantographs are just pushed through the holes in the, in the top of the, the model. And they, these are folded over and it's just a soldered on cable. And there, there's the switch. And that's the selector we saw on top of the model. And there's those four screws holding the top plate in. And obviously the pantographs will be will be mounted in there and there's that clip on plate there that goes over the top of the uh, the selector switch. So quite an interesting thing, but again, so many models getting uh, use out of this basic motor bogey. Quite, a, quite a, a neat idea. So we'll just pop that down and we'll have a, a swift look at the, uh, the inside of this one. We'll just pop out the, the screws. So again, just the two screws on the top here, I suppose these these sit where the uh, the pantographs or underneath the pantographs. So just pop that out there and we'll see if we can lift that out. Perhaps I'll undo the other one a little more. There we go. So this one I have uh, modified a fair bit myself. So uh, making it run, I'll just use that terminal connector there to connect the two ends of the model. So the wiring is very short if you're trying to keep them connected. So we've got lighting running at both ends of the model there. So if I just drop the, uh, the motor bogey out there and we'll have a, a quick look at it. 
So the uh, the switch or the, the wiring underneath the underneath the switch there all drops down into this center section under here. So we'll just re remove that screw and we'll just ease that down and have a look at the inside there. So there is the old motor buggy and you can see this one has been fairly mutilated by soldering over the years. Of course that is, is the way to keep it together but when you want to change the bulb and it really isn't that uh, that ideal you should have those pins on the end of the cable so they push in but they are very frustrating and they drop out so we'll just pop that back in there see if I can get that screw in loosely so the whole model doesn't come apart in my hands There we go. It's a shouldered screw, so it allows it to uh, to move quite freely. Again, if I just pop out this bottom plate here, you can have a look at the other end of the model. You can hear that snap open. There we go. So you could easily have a have another motor buggy in there, couldn't you? And you can see the wirings run to the other end. So those are those pins. The original ones in the end of this so there's a full set in the green one but they do tend to just sort of work their way out and you get an intermittent connection so that's my reluctance at dismantling the other model but very clever piece of design i think just catching up with this group of models now as they drop back down onto level ground passing underneath the elevated section we're going to snap open points number five and bring the whole group onto the passing loop. There go the points, nice glimpse of the headlamp there. Well behaved as ever, these coaches, and then we'll snap the point shut. It is just tremendous, that sound of those uh, knurled wheels on the steel track. Just listen, as we back off the power, how, how nice it is when that sound disappears. It really is quite a racket. Nice gentle stop there. And we'll have a, a swift look at these coaches. Um, as we saw from the catalogues earlier on, when they first showed up in the catalogue in 61, they had uh, trying railways along the tops of the coaches. And from what I've read, maybe the, the first batch had that and then they switched to this transcontinental wording uh, above the windows. But uh, we've got the uh, the baggage stroke kitchen car here, R337. And then we have the, the diner, R338. And then we have the coach, R335. And then we have the uh, observation car and this lovely dome on the top here and that's uh, R336. Now uh, they did have a relatively short life I think. Um, I think they ultimately were available between 62 and 63. So if we have a, a swift look at the uh, the baggage car, although I think um, there were quite a, quite a lot of stocks left in the UK and they, they were shipped out to other markets and possibly available out through uh, 64, possibly Canada and New Zealand and Australia and so on. So again, really beautiful looking things. And again, there's that sort of effect on the uh, the glazing behind there to to obscure the glass in, in perhaps the kitchen compartment there, the, the baggage stroke kitchen car. The doors don't open unlike the, the earlier series um, uh, transcontinental coaches, so they're, they're fixed. So some, some lovely underframe detail going on. Lovely detail all the way around. Grey plastic roofs. So not too much detail on there. A little bit at, at either end there. We'll have a, a swift look underneath. Now these don't have pinpoint axles. They have uh, sleeved wheels, but uh, closed axle boxes. If we have a look there. So you've got a single metal axle and then two sleeved parts of the wheels. So they, they do spin relatively freely. There's a, a little oil on that one. Perhaps we should uh, wipe some of that off. And then we've got the old uh, Mark III style coupling there. A little bit of a bend going on in there, isn't there? So uh, the underframe detail is part of the main, the main coach. It's all, all moulded in one and sprayed up, as you can see there. And this plate here, I presume, is to try and give some sort of attachment to the, to the bottom of the coach that I hold, hold the roof on. So, 
fairly pretty thing, so we'll pop that one down. So that's the baggage stroke kitchen car. And then we've got the diner, which I think shares the same body as, as the coach. Certainly looks to have the, the same underframe detail. And we've got the seating unit in there. I believe that might be from the uh, the Pullman cars. So we'll just have a swift look around the coach. Again, I think that shares the same roof as the model we've just looked at. So again, it would have been nice perhaps to some attempt on lighting in these, but uh, maybe that would have been very difficult to make it run, perhaps with the, the friction element. So we'll just have a swift look under there. And uh, quite nice detail on those bogies, I think. I was quite, thought they were quite impressive looking. So we'll just pop that one down. So that's the diner. And there's the coach. So a different sort of seating unit. They're quite slanted, the, the angle of those seats, aren't they? I'm just noticing some sort of flakes of something red there. I'm not sure whether that's come off the fragments of boxes and so on. So uh, not not for these coaches, as sadly I don't have any boxes for these coaches. They're all unboxed. So fairly pretty things. Not much wear to them, really. Although well, the wheels were very, very dirty when I got them. So they've all been removed and cleaned and uh, oiled just this morning. So perhaps it's time to wipe a little of that off. Seems to have seeped out of the, the centers of the axles there. So we'll pop that down. It is quite, quite interesting detail through here though. The closer you look, the more you see. Just looking under, under there. So we'll just pop that down. And then we've got the, the terrific observation coach. A lovely tint of green in the glass there, isn't there? Sort of beige seating. Again, these uh, observation coaches in the uh, second series of TC coaches tend to get over tightened and they, they pull in here. Much more. Uh, much less sort of spray work on the bottom of there, isn't there? Very, very little under frame detail. And you see the, the screw just goes straight through the bottom of the coach there. There's no black plastic plate. So you can see the underside of the, the seating unit, the interior seating unit in there. If I take my hand away, perhaps we can see through. So they've gone to a lot of trouble with these, I think. And even the other other liveries didn't seem to last that long. I think the blue livery lasted the longest, but it had a possibly a break in production. And I love this detailing across the top of the the tail end of the coach there. So really, rather rather pretty things. Just snap open points number four there. And then off we go, back to the outside line. Lovely glow from that red signal lamp there, isn't there, on the side of those coaches? Very dramatic. And then we'll snap those points shut. We're going to come past the station there and then through points number eight. Lovely seeing the pantographs at work there. And again, a nice shot of them coming through the point work there from one line to the other. Coaches wobble just a little bit, but I think that's to be expected on all that bumpy point work. With a great wide angle shot there. And we're coming into that first radius curve at the far end of the layout there. And we're going to bring them gently to a stop now outside the station. And we're going to take advantage of that uh, uncoupling ramp. We've just got to back up a little there. There we go. Just take the tension out of the couplings. There we go. Uncoupled. And off we go. And I think we'll get this uh, electric locomotive back to the uh, yards next to the engine sheds through points one there, past the turntable, just beyond points number 18, we'll have a nice stop, we'll switch those, and number 17, and I think that's probably it for this week. Thanks again for watching, it's hugely appreciated. If you look back again next time, we'll have something else from the range to look at. Goodbye now.